so the course's second objective is for you to be able to describe basic population dynamics. So obviously we've got to start with what are populations and then we have to talk about all of the things that influence population growth and then we have to link those to the human population on the planet. So here we go, starting out. Population characteristics. A population is a group of individuals of the same species found in the same area. So all of the people found in your town would be that town's population. All of the humans found in your state would be your state's population. You're given the area and the species. So in the same way, all of the largemouth bass, a type of fish found in your local lake, are the population of bass in that lake. Now remember that a species is a group of animals that are very similar genetically so that they can breed together to produce offspring that can also breed together to produce offspring that can breed together to produce offspring. So anything to do with the birth of individuals that would be called a natality. Anything to do with the death of individuals that would be mortality. So natality is births and mortality is deaths. Every population out there grows in the same way. They have show a standard population growth curve. So populations of mice on this slide um, initially uh, don't grow very fast. The population really doesn't increase in size at all for some time. That's called the lag period. Then the population grows very, very quickly, and there's our exponential period. And then the population doesn't grow anymore, and there's our stable equilibrium period. So a population growth curve is just a graph of this rate of growth of the population. Now we need to talk about this and describe what's going on in a little bit more detail. And the first part we're going to talk about is the very beginning of the curve. If you look at the graph, um, it doesn't start out at the origin. The population doesn't start at the axis uh, corner there. It doesn't start at the origin. It doesn't start at zero, zero. Uh, if you look on our little slide here, it starts where there's this thing that says 5500 rule. That's where our graph is started. Because if we have no individuals in the population, we have no individuals. There is no population. If you take a sealed container, with no mice in it and watch that container forever you won't end up with mice in it as long as it's sealed they don't just spontaneously pop into existence to start a population you have to start the population with a minimum number now most individuals will say oh yeah you have to have two and if we use humans as our example if we only have two humans to start our population then the population will start quite easily um, we've got one man one woman, uh, they have sex and have children, and there's our first generation being produced. Our first new generation would be their children. Now, if the man and woman continue to have sex and have children, all they're making is more individuals of that generation. All their kids need to be having sex to make the next generation. And that's where the problem comes. Who do they have sex with? Brothers and sisters having sex? Dads and daughters having sex? Sons and mothers having sex? Now, in mice, that interbreeding definitely does happen. In humans, it's definitely frowned upon. And the reason it's frowned upon is because it leads to genetic problems. So you can see that if it's a human situation, starting with only two individuals presents a big problem of... Uh, how do you get your third generation along? In mice, they have that third generation, but with all the inbreeding, they definitely have a hard time with increased genetic diseases, increased genetic um, malformations, and therefore the population is not as healthy. If you want a population to stay healthy, then your 5500 rule comes into effect. And geneticists say that if you start a population with 50 individuals, um, and they're not related, then there's enough genetic diversity there that you won't have those incestual genetic problems popping up. 
and if you have 500 individuals obviously that's large amounts of variety and that population will survive for the long term without any genetic abnormalities. So the 50-500 rule, 50 individuals that are completely not related give you a nice stable population growth um, but there might be a limit for how long that population can go on. 500, that's an unlimited population. We've got plenty of genetic diversity there. That population can go on forever without ancestral problems of um, uh, decreased genetic veracity, the population not having the good genes to support new children. So that's our start point. Let's start with 50, 500 period. Right, then we've got the lag. Lag phase comes along, not really getting any growth. And that's, you know, should be expected. If we're dealing with a human population, there would have to be a lag time of at least nine and a bit months. Because even if people were having sex on the first day, um, it would take a nine month gestation before babies would be born and added to the population. It's doubtful that um, a population would even start reproducing on the first day, though. Um, if you could imagine, if a group of humans were sucked out from the population by a spaceship, dumped onto a uh, planet somewhere in a different galaxy, it's doubtful that they would arrive, um, land on the planet, look around and say, all right, let's take our clothes off and have sex. And the trauma of just arriving in a new area would probably lead to uh, a period of time where the population is just acclimatizing to that area, uh, finding their food sources, finding their water sources. So normally there's a period where there's not a lot of sex going even at the beginning. And also there tends to be um, some deaths early on. If you've ever bought fish from the uh, pet store, you'll definitely know about this. You buy a bag of fish, you take them home, you put them in the tank, a whole bunch of them die straight away. Um, so that early reproduction is generally just replacing those few that have been lost. So the lag period tends to always be longer than the gestation period. We've got a gestation period, we've got to make up for those individuals that are dying. And it's only at the end of that point that the population then starts to grow. Now once the population does grow, most populations tend to grow exponentially. That is two individuals make four individuals, make eight individuals, make 16 individuals. The numbers don't grow arithmetically. They don't go one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't go up one birth at a time. The population explodes in number, rapid, rapid growth rate. So we see this exponential, very steep curve. And then the top part, we can see that it goes flatter again. The, the rate of population growth slows down and then becomes no population growth. Now that does not occur because there's no more reproduction going on. Reproduction is still going on at the same rate. So we have large amounts of reproduction, so why isn't the population growing? And the population is growing because of death mortality is occurring. The death rate has increased. The numbers of deaths are increasing in the population. And as those deaths increase, they cancel out all of the births that have been taking place. So we need to talk a little bit later about why those um, deaths increase. But for now, we're just going to say the deaths increase. They start to equal the number of births. And because deaths and births equal, the size of the population um, levels off. It doesn't increase anymore. Now, this growth curve is mostly called an S-shaped growth curve. So we're going to look at uh, this S-shape in slightly more detail, talk about why deaths increase, why births may decrease, and um, then talk about some other types of growth curve. So on our last slide, we said that the type of growth curve we were seeing was an S-shaped growth curve. And you can see the blue line on this uh, slide is exactly the same curve. Um, starts out uh, not at zero population, but a little bit higher, our 5500 roll. And then continues on in a lag phase before hitting an exponential phase and then go into stable equilibrium phase. Now we said that we got to stable equilibrium because the number of deaths in the population increased 
uh, they were still having births in the population, but because deaths were equal in the number of births, the population was no longer growing and we were stable. Now, on this slide, we can see two things we need to talk about. The first one is carrying capacity, the dotted line. Carrying capacity is the size of the population that the environment can support for the long term. So it's the size of the population the environment can support for the long term. How big a population can live in this area without degrading the environment so that it prevents the population from living any longer. Um, carrying capacity is not a fixed number. It changes all the time. If there's a drought, the carrying capacity decreases. If there's uh, a bumper crop this year, then carrying capacity would increase. So carrying capacity is a floating number. It fluctuates each year, each season. And we can see that our S-shaped curve is keeping our population just under the carrying capacity. That's why it's stable. The population has stabilized just beneath the size of population that the environment can support. So the environment can support it, so our environment is keeping our population healthy, the population will go on indefinitely. So there's our S-shaped curve. The next thing that's on that slide there is environmental resistance. Environmental resistance is the environment resisting population growth, the environment stopping population growth. So our environment is going to stop population growth. It is going to push back population growth, preventing the population getting bigger, and preventing that population going over carrying capacity. So environmental resistance is making an S-shaped growth curve for this population. Now there is a different type of growth curve. It's called a J-shaped growth curve. And here the pink line is showing a J-shaped growth curve for a population. Notice that it starts out at the normal point. It doesn't start at zero individuals. We have to start with our 5500 rule. And then the population goes through the lag period. And that lag period um, is not showing any population growth. Then we hit exponential area. And the exponential growth is very fast. The growth is much faster than in a normal S-shaped curve, a very steep section. And the growth is so quick that the population goes over carrying capacity. So the population is larger than the environment can support. We said to overshoot the carrying capacity. So the population is bigger than the environment can support. The environment can't keep all those individuals alive and the population goes through dieback individuals in the population die. So we get mass death. Population dies, population comes crashing back down. So an example of this would be bacteria in milk. Now you take a milk jug home, you open your milk jug, and there's really no bacteria in there. And when you open it, you let in air, in goes some bacteria, and you keep it in the fridge, and that fridge prevents the bacteria growing very quickly and gives you a very big lag time. So we get a lag period of a number of days where the milk really doesn't have any uh, stuff growing in it. Now, once the milk has been sitting in the fridge for a few days, the bacteria do start to grow. But at the beginning, they start fairly slowly, so you won't notice it. Now, if you go on vacation for a week and then come back, then things have changed. Those bacteria in that milk jug have grown like crazy. Uh, they grow extremely fast. They shoot through the carrying capacity. The population is huge, but they're sealed inside the plastic jug. That environment cannot support that many bacteria. Their wastes are not being cleaned up. They're just staying inside the milk jug. There's no more food being provided because there's no fresh milk being put in the milk jug. So the environment can't support that size population and all the bacteria go through dieback. They then die. And you'll see that. There's a big chunks and lumps of nasty dead bacteria, just nasty separated milk, stinks to high heaven, death has occurred in there, blur. Now we will get another population of bacteria that will take off and it will also show a J-shaped curve. But those bacteria will go through J-shaped growth periods, um, populations growing rapidly and then dying back.
So to sum up, we have two types of growth curve, J-shaped curves and S-shaped curves. S-shaped curves um, tend to have a slightly shallower, less steep exponential phase, and they remain below carrying capacity, showing equilibrium. So the population growth slows down and then becomes stable, and it stays beneath the carrying capacity of the environment, so it can live for a long time. J-shaped curves tend to have a much faster exponential period, much steeper curve, shoot right through carrying capacity, and then go through dieback, go through a death phase. Remember that carrying capacity is the largest sustainable population that an environment can support. And please remember that it's not fixed. Right? This is not a fixed number that is the same all the time. Every single time there's a, a seasonal change, every time there's a flood, every time there's a bumper crop or food comes available, it changes the carrying capacity of an area. So we can alter the carrying capacity of certain areas by using better farming techniques so we can support more people or being able to supply more fresh water to an area so it can supply more people. Of course we can push it down the other way if we use bad farming techniques and lose topsoil then we lose the ability to produce as many foods and the population can capacity is dropped. It now can't support as many people. And also remember that when we go into the exponential phase it's not because births disappear it's because deaths increase. The birth rate may decrease slightly. We we're going to see some decrease in birth rate, but the biggest cause of that stable period is an increase in death rate. It's an increase in the amount of death occurring in the population. So we've got to look at what is causing that. What are the factors that produce environmental resistance? So here's some factors that lead to environmental resistance. Um, so, food supply is probably the most obvious one. If there were more animals in this area than there is food to feed them all, um, some of them will starve and their reproductive output will be decreased. Uh, females won't be able to make enough milk for their young and therefore the young will die, reproductive outputs decreased. Um, they won't be able to just provide enough nutrients what for their young while they're in the womb and therefore they'll miscarry and therefore reproductive output will go down. Uh, you just physically won't be able to find food as an adult um, and therefore you'll die before reproducing and therefore reproductive output will go down. So I'm pretty sure that seeing starvation as an, a nice easy environmental resistance factor is pretty simple. Um, if we look at other ones we've got diseases uh, if you think about um, crowded cities and how easy it is to pass a disease from one person to another, how many people you meet in a day, as populations increase, it's much easier to pass diseases from one individual to the next. Um, if you're living in North Dakota and your uh, nearest neighbors live five miles away, if you get the flu, it's very difficult for you to pass the flu on to them because they live five miles away. Uh, if you're living in New York City and your next door neighbor lives uh, one flight of stairs above you and one flight of stairs below you and on each side of your door, um, the chances are that when you go into and out of your apartment block, uh, you're going to find it very, very easy to pass on that flu to a whole bunch of people in your apartment block. So just passing diseases, the effect of diseases, is much larger in a big dense population than it is in a small well spread out population. Um, we've got limited space you know if we're talking about trees in a forest if the population is very large there's just not a lot of space for new seedlings to grow. Uh, all of the large adult trees outcompete the young trees preventing them getting any light, preventing them getting large amounts of water and the small trees just can't compete so their uh, reproductive capacity is pushed down. The population can't get any new individuals in the area because there's already trees living there. Uh, the oxygen supply, that's one definitely for uh, a fish one where now 
Um, if you have too many fish in your goldfish bowl, they just physically don't get enough oxygen. There's not enough waste dispersal uh, abilities. And even though you might use a filter on the tank, if you put too many fish in your fish tank, the filter can't clean up the waste fast enough from the fish. The, f the filters won't put in enough oxygen, and then you get a bunch of fish die. And when those fish die, once the fish below become below carrying capacity again, now there's enough waste to clean up, now there's enough oxygen delivery and those fish can live healthily. So environmental resistance is just really any factor that's going to push down and in the slide you can see it's looking like hands pushing on the size of the population, preventing that population from growing any larger. Extrinsic factors are those factors that come from outside the population. So they come from things other than the species that we're talking about. So if our population we're talking about is caribou, then wolves feeding on the caribou would be an extrinsic factor. Um, accidents of nature, uh, a flood, a forest fire, don't come from the caribou. That's an accident of nature. Um, therefore, they're all extrinsic f limiting factors. Intrinsic limiting factors come from the population that we're dealing about. So if we're talking about uh, the caribou eating down a whole bunch of brush and therefore um, starving because they've literally eaten themselves out of house and home, that's intrinsic. That was caused by that species. So behavioral changes in people that cause them to have more babies or have less babies, they would be called intrinsic factors. On the same line, we have density-dependent and density-independent limiting factors. Um, density-dependent are those that become worse as the size of the population increases. So we talked about the idea of flu being passed between people the larger the population. That's a density-dependent limiting factor. It depends on having lots of people there. Density-independent factors, the size of the population has no influence here. Um, if there's a volcano go, goes off, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, there with a hundred people or you, you're there with ten people. If you're standing on the volcano, it's going to ruin your afternoon. It's going to kill you. Um, just because you were there with twenty more people than normal doesn't mean you die more when the volcano goes off. You die whether you're there on your own, whether you're there with ten people, or whether you're there with a hundred people. It didn't matter about how big the population was. What mattered was you were just unlucky enough to be standing on the uh, volcano. Exactly the same way for a tidal wave. The size of the population does not influence whether you get a tidal wave or not. Um, the volcanic activity that produced it had nothing to do with the size of the population. So limiting factors come in four main categories. The first one is raw material availability. So this is things like um, can I actually get enough fresh water to drink every day? Is that available to me? Um, is there enough raw material for me to be able to build my house? Can I get enough uh, wood to build a house? Can I get enough wood to uh, build a plow to pull behind my oxen? Uh, raw material stuff is can uh, coal get enough calcium to build their shells? Can oysters collect enough calcium to build their shells? All raw material availability. Second one is energy availability. So for humans this would be, you know, can I get enough food? Is there enough food there for me to eat so that I can stay healthy? Do I get enough calories every day? Notice that for plant populations, this one would be availability of sunlight. Is there enough sunlight for us to do photosynthesis to keep ourselves healthy? Third one, accumulation of waste products. Um, this one's pretty obvious. If you took a, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer area of land and had only two people living in there, um, there's no way that wastes would be a problem. They could use the, you know, defecate and urinate uh, every day, week after week, month after month, and in that size area, um, natural processes would break down their waste, and there would not be any harmful buildup. Change that and put 4,000 people living in that area, and you're going to have accumulation of wastes. Uh, you're going to have 
you know, sewage runoff into drinking water, and then you'll have problems with the population. So this accumulation of waste is definitely density dependent. It gets worse with a bigger population. And the last one, the interactions among organisms. Now we're dealing with predators, predation, how predators are feeding, and uh, diseases, how pathogens, organisms that cause disease, affect the population. So remember that um, there are two general classifications of countries around the world, more developed countries and less developed countries. And uh, the impact of population is different in both of those countries. Um, the next couple of slides, again, I'm trying to get you to think about what the average human population is like. Remember, 80% is generally less developed country, only 20% is more developed country. So most people are not living like you. Most people don't have internet and cable TV and everything. So here we have a little boy outside his home and if you look carefully at the slide you can see that he's just urinated right outside his home. That's where his bathroom is. The black tarp in the background, uh, that would be the doorway to their house. That would be their door. Most of the house is made out of this wicker woven material, plastic, signage. Um, so just a very, very different lifestyle than what most people in a more developed country would face. Obviously, the limiting factors facing this family are completely different than yours. Uh, food supply is an issue. Let's see, let's see the next slide for that. So when we pull back, and you can see a little bit more of where that house is, um, we can see that it, it's built on a trash dump. Uh, these people are pickers. They pick through the trash to try and earn their money. Um, they have this one animal right in the center of the screen there. You've got a goat that's eating trash. And this animal um, is providing milk for that family. That's their milk supply. So obviously they live on trash. They pick through trash to find usable items. They sell trash. And they eat an animal, drink animal's milk that's eating trash. Uh, disease, much more prevalent in this society. Lack of nutrition, much more prevalent in this society. So the large amounts of limiting factors, and that influences population size, influences population growth rate, influences life expectancy. So this population is not going to be just like the population that we have here in the United States. Availability of fresh water is definitely one of the main limiting factors in this area, and this slide happens to be where that family collects their drinking water from. Um, so what they do is they come down, and uh, this is um, a section of bridge right near uh, where they live. So in the top left hand part of the screen, we can see is there is a bridge with a truck going over it. You can just see the back wheel and the differential right in the left corner there. Um, then we've got this big s concrete slab down in the bottom left corner. That's where they would stand. And the rest of the slide is actually the river. It's just got a whole bunch of styrofoam waste in it. So that styrofoam waste is covering the water. All they do is they push that styrofoam waste away, and that's where they get their water. Um, so obviously, uh, clean water is a massive limiting factor because they don't have availability of fresh water. The water that they get in is definitely um, not what we would drink over here in in the United States. It's just it's just nasty. There's no no other way of saying it. That is just nasty. So um, availability of fresh water definitely a large environmental frac uh, limiting factor here. Now, if you look at how human population on the planet has changed through history, we can see that um, there's an extremely long lag phase. The lag phase is lasting for an enormous amount of time through the Stone Age, through the Bronze Age, through the Iron Age, through the Middle Ages and we only really hit exponential growth since the Industrial Revolution. It's at the Industrial Revolution where exponential growth in the human population just takes off. Now this is just a a graph of human population growth from one source. So what I have on the next slide is the same graph from a slightly different source just so you know that it's you know it's not just the way it's put in. So let's go to the next slide. Alright so next slide 
population growth curve really doesn't look very different. We've got this really long lag phase. We hit the Industrial Revolution, boom, exponential growth. And exponential growth just takes off. And our population now is almost 7 billion people. So very, very close to 7 billion people. And if you look how long it took to go f our last billion people, to add that last billion from 6 to 7, um, you can see that it's very difficult to try and read that on the scale of this slide because it's only 14 years, 20 years. Um, to add the next billion people, you can see it's showing up as being even less. It's showing up as being, what is that, you know, 10 years, 12, 10, 8 years. And then adding the next billion people from 8 to 9, you can see the line gets even thinner. And it's taking, what, 6 years? So, um, population started out very, very slow growth, very long lag phase, extremely slow growth of the human population. And then, boom, rapid exponential growth. So the first question we have is, so what type of growth curve are we showing? Are we showing an S-shaped curve or a J-shaped curve? So I just asked you whether the human population is showing an S or a J-shaped growth curve. And um, if you look at them with their long uh, lag phase, it doesn't tell you anything. With the exponential phase, you can see that the exponential phase was very steep, uh, so there is an indication that it might be J shape. But the key part is does it go into stable equilibrium or does it go into dieback? And for our curves, we don't have any of that information. There's none of that section available. Um, and so because the curve is not complete, because we only have the lag period and the exponential period, it's actually unknowable. We don't know whether we're in an S-shaped curve or we're in a J-shaped curve. Now, it, it would be nice to know, because if we are S-shaped, then our population will level out. It will become a stable equilibrium and below carrying capacity and we'll be able to uh, maintain our population for a very long period of time. And as our goal for environmental science is to produce a sustainable society, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Of course, it'd also be nice to know if it was J-shape, because if it's J-shape, then we would have a dieback period where large numbers of the population um, would be dying. And that is something that environmental scientists are hoping to avoid. Um, mass death of the human population is not something that environmental scientists wish to occur. So we don't actually know how big, um, what size and shape growth curve we're showing just yet. We do, however, know how large the population is. And if you go to that website right there, you'll be able to find out how, how big it is. And it's around about 7 billion people right now. So about now we're at about 7 billion people in our population. You can find out the exact number if you go and use that hot link there, that, that uh, URL. So we've got a very large population. The population is definitely still growing rapidly. Not as rapid as it was doing five years ago. Um, it's definitely slowed down a bit. So what are we going to do? Um, the role of the environmental science is to produce a sustainable society. And with that role, we have to guarantee that our population is showing an S-shaped curve. If we're in S-shape, we'll go into equilibrium, and population will be below carrying capacity. And because we're below carrying capacity, the population will be supported for the long term. We want to try and guarantee that we're not in a J-shaped curve, so our population doesn't crash back during a dieback period. So what we're going to do for the rest of the course is talk about, okay, how can we get it so that we're showing an S-shaped curve? How can we make sure that we've gone into stable equilibrium? Now we need to make sure you've got some basic knowledge down before we move on and talk about these factors. First thing you need to know is birth rate. So birth rate, the number of births per 1,000 people per year. And rates are always per 1,000 people per year. So the birth rate, number of births per 1,000 people per year. Death rate would be number of deaths per 1,000 people per year. We use rates so we can compare one country to another. You couldn't look at England and compare it to the United States 
because uh, the land mass is so different, the population size is so different. But if we look at rates, then we can do a direct comparison because it's always per 1,000 people. So by using rates, we can compare Chad to Ethiopia to Spain to England to the United States. Now, when you're dealing with the size of a population of an area, um, we get this very simple equation. The population size equals the number of births plus the amount of immigration minus the number of deaths plus the amount of emigration. So if we were looking at a local forest and we're dealing with a population of deer, then things that would make the population get bigger would be deer that were born and deer that immigrated into the area, that came into the area, walked into that forest. Things that would make the population smaller would be deer dying or deer walking out of that area, walking out of that forest that is emigrating. So if we're dealing with animals in a forest, birth plus immigration, get rid of the deaths and emigration, you get the population size. So if we're dealing with bluegills, as another example in a lake, then what we've got is the number of bluegills is increased by new births, so new bluegills being born into that lake, and any bluegills that happen to swim down into the lake from local streams and rivers add to the population. Um, did bluegills that are killed, or bluegills that leave, say they swim over the dam or they swim out up a river away from the lake, would lead to a decrease in population size. So do the math and you work out what the new population size is. Now what's easy for humans on a global scale is that we can get rid of two of these. So on a global scale when we're dealing with human population size we don't have any immigration onto planet Earth, we don't have any emigration from planet Earth, nobody leaves permanently to go live somewhere else on a different planet, nobody's coming in from a different planet to live on Earth. So for the human population on a global scale our population size becomes births minus deaths. So if we're going to try and produce an S-shaped growth curve, we only have two factors to work with. We've got births and deaths. To prevent our population growing, we either have to decrease the number of births or we have to increase the number of deaths. Now, as an environmental scientist, you've got to look at that and you've got to say, okay, so morally, which one is more acceptable? Should we work on the birth side or should we work on the death side? And for environmental scientists, they pick the birth side. They generally don't want to try and increase deaths. They don't want to have squads going around saying, okay, you, you, you've lived your life now, that's it. You, you can't live any longer because the population is too big. They don't want to work on the death side. So the side that they try and work on is the birth side. And there is a scientific reason for doing that, and we'll talk about that later in the course. So what we've got is we've got human population size is directly related to one, the number of births, and two, the number of deaths. So there's only two factors that we can work with. And by moral choice, we're not going to try and increase our death rate. We're going to try and decrease our birth rate to control population size. The population growth rate is the birth rate minus the death rate. Remember the birth rate is the number of births per 1,000 people per year. The death rate is the number of deaths per 1,000 people per year. So you do the simple sum, birth rate minus death rate, and that will give you the population growth rate. Population growth rate um, is often expressed as an annual rate of increase. Now, remember that birth rate is per 1,000 individuals, and death rate is per 1,000 individuals. And percentage is per 100. Yeah, A percent is how much out of 100. So to find our annual rate of increase, the sum becomes the birth rate minus the death rate divided by 10. Now, that 10 is there to change the thousands into hundreds. That's what makes it a percent. So birth rate minus the death rate divided by 10 is the annual rate of increase of a population. So we'll give you a figure like it's growing at 2% a year or it's growing at 4% a year. Now for most humans, um, being told a percentage rate 
means nothing. That's why credit cards work, because you don't understand how much money you're going to have to pay. That's why mortgages work, because nobody understands how much you have to pay on your house. Very few people have bothered to do that actual work of, okay, I'm paying a 4% mortgage, how much is that costing me? Um, so it's exactly the same with population studies. If we tell you that a population of country XYZ is growing at an annual rate of increase of 2%, that really doesn't mean much to most people. So to make it more meaningful, we'll convert that into doubling time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 70, and we're gonna divide 70 by the annual rate of increase, that percentage number. So if we said a 2%, what we'd do is we'd do 70 divided by that 2%. So 70 divided by two tells you how long it's gonna take for that population to double in size. So obviously you'd see if our percentage increase was 2%, 2, 2% 2 increase would have 70 divided by 2. What does that work out to be? It works out to be 35 years. So our population would double in 35 years. That's meaningful. Then you could go, wow, in my lifetime, the population is going to be twice the size. Double in time is much simpler to work out. So just be prepared that you're going to have to do these on the test. Um, I'm going to probably give you a birth rate and a death rate and get you to work out a percentage increase and then you're going to have to work out double in time. So make sure you can do those. Quick look at how birth rate and death rate are influencing population size. On the first graph here we've got Costa Rica, very high birth rate, a uh, birth rate of 26 and a death rate is fairly low, it's only you know minus 4 and you can see that the population is growing rapidly not that many people dying, large amounts of uh, births, very large amounts of births, given a very rapid population growth rate. And you can see it's got an annual rate of increase of 11.4%. Um, so you should be able to work out doubling time now, 70 divided by 11.4 equals doubling time. Very rapid doubling time. The United States on the other hand, only 15 births per thousand people, way less kids being born, nine people dying, and you can see that our population is growing, but it's growing very, very slowly. We've got a 3% uh, increase. So a 3% population increase, fairly slow. And the last one, Hungary, you can see that they've got 11 uh, births per thousand individuals per year and 14 deaths per thousand individuals per year. Population is just nose diving. Population now is actually shrinking every year. Larger number of deaths. So they've got a population decrease of 1.5 percent a year. Just showing you how having large numbers of births, fewer deaths, will allow your population to grow exponentially really quick. Having um, similar births and deaths, nice stable population, and having lots more uh, deaths than births will then cause your population to decrease. Now we already did population growth curves and we're going to have a second type of curve and do not get these confused. Growth curves show you how the population grows. Growth curves come in two types, S-shape and J-shape. What we're going to do here is we're going to look at a separate curve. It's called a survivorship curve. And this is not showing you how a population grows. It shows you the individuals that survive in a population. So if we were to take all of the individuals born in January of this year, what we would do is we would watch that group of individuals throughout their life. And every January of every successive year, count how many of them have survived, count how many are still alive. So this January would have our starting number, next January how many are still alive, next January how many are still alive, January after that how many are still alive, and just keep on going until they're all dead. And when we plot it, that plot, that curve is our survivorship curve. So let's have a look what they look like. So we can see here that we've got a type A curve, and it's the red curve and a type A uh, survivorship curve it stays fairly flat and then drops off rapidly and you can see the graph is divided into three areas the dependency period um, that's often called uh, pre-reproductive or de a period pre-reproductive that's from the age 0 through the age of 14 so these are our kids 
And survivorship curve A, you can see very few of the kids die. This is a curve found in more developed countries. Very few children die. Once they're in the reproductive period, that's between 15 and 44, um, then again, curves basically flat, virtually no deaths. Right? We all know a few people that have died, but out of all the people on uh, the United States, very few of them die in between those ages. So, very likely, very high likelihood of survivorship, very flat survivorship curve. Then we move into the post-reproductive period, that's 45 and older. There are old fogies, uh, post-reproductive, and uh, it doesn't matter what you do. When you get old, you die. So the curve survives for a long time, and then boom, drop off, because old age comes and just whacks everybody. Ultimately, with the survivorship curve, everybody dies. But it's showing you that most people survive to old age in more developed countries. Very few people die. Now, if we look at the purple curve, the type C survivorship curve, it's got a different shape. We start out in our dependency period, our 0 to 14 year olds, our pre-reproductive period. A whole bunch of the kids die. Lots and lots of children die. Very less developed country, large amount of infant mortality. Lots of children are dying. Now, if they survive to reproductive period, our 15 to 44-year-olds, then they're probably going to make it. They've got very strong immune systems, they've learned how to survive, and they generally will survive through that period. They go into post-reproductive, they manage to live there, old age hits them, boom, and they die. So if we were to compare the shapes of the curve, the post-reproductive period, the old fogies, it's not really that different. You know, they're both straight, and then boom, old age catches up and they die. If we look at the reproductive period, um, they're not that different. They're both sort of just flat lines. The type A and the type C, they're both dead flat lines. There's not a lot of difference there. They're in different points on the graph, but their shape is the same shape. The part that is different between the type A and the type C happens in this dependency period, this pre-reproductive. It's happened to the children. In more developed countries, we do not let our children die. We keep our children alive. In less developed countries, large amounts of children die. That infant mortality, the children dying is high. And that tells us a mass amount of information. Number one, it tells us why the human population went exponential. Right? If you remember our growth curve, the humans had a long lag period. Then we hit the exponential period and the population just grows. Why did our population grow? It started growing because we stopped our children dying. Children used to be born. Large numbers of them would die during childbirth. Large numbers of them would die during their um, younger years. We don't do that anymore. We keep our kids alive. We keep our kids alive. That's why we went exponential. Less developed countries, they still have a higher death rate of children, but compared to previous years, it's got better. We do export aid to those countries. They do have some medical facilities. They do have a better ability to grow crops. So life now is better than it was 400 years ago. There's much less death of children than there was 400 years ago. So we're seeing that 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 push, that that push to make the population exponential with prevented kids dying. Second thing it tells us is, well, how do we get to stable equilibrium? We were stable. We were stable for a long time in the lag phase. And it shows us how we can be stable again. If we could move our type A curve so it was lower down on the graph, level with the reproductive portion of the C curve, our population would be at stable equilibrium. So let me just say that again. If we could take the type A curve, instead of having it at the top of the graph, push it down, move it down, so that the reproductive period of the type A was overlying, was sitting right over the type C line. The red line was fitting over the middle portion of the purple line. Our population would be stable. Now it tells you that 
to do that, to move that type A curve down, you have to have less children. Have um, just a little bit more, around about half the kids that we're having today, and our type A curve would be sitting right over the top of the type C curve in the reproductive period and the post reproductive period, just in those two sections. So if we had less kids, if we had less births, our population would be in stable equilibrium. So remember, we said to fix the population, you've got to do two things either decrease births or increase deaths. This graph is showing you why decreasing births will work. If you can pull down the type A line, make it about level with the type C middle portion, then you get a stable equilibrium. Then the population, instead of growing exponentially, is growing not at all. It's just stable. The number of kids being produced is equal in the number of reproductive adults that we have our population becomes stable, we go into equilibrium below carrying capacity, and we have a sustainable society. If you keep having large numbers of children, keep adding new populations, new adults to the population, the population continues to grow, we may not be S-shaped growth curve. Now why did our kids um, stop dying? Why did more developed kids prevent dying. And, and in fact it's, there's more to it than that. The human population has shown three bursts where we've prevented the kids dying. Tool making. When we learned how to use tools, learned how to make fire, um, we prevented our children from dying, our population grew. Agricultural revolution. When we did agriculture and we could make more food and we could make enough food to store for the winter so during the winter period we wouldn't starve, our kids would survive. And then we hit the Industrial Revolution, and it's there that our population really becomes stable. We get refrigeration, so we have food throughout the year. We have food that doesn't have uh, food poisoning in it, so less people die. We get refrigeration and freezing to keep food for the winter. We get canning. So, in a more developed country, the availability of food throughout the year is just fantastic. There's always 2,000 calories a day available every day of the year, no matter what season we're in. We have the ability to transfer nutrients from one portion of a country to another, so we never run out. We are cleaning our drinking water. We have waste removal, sewage treatment plants, so we don't have diseases spreading. Medical facilities, uh, using antibiotics to control diseases, antifungal agents to control diseases. We have the ability to get over um, impacts and traumas to our bodies. Our medicine has kept our children alive. So as we keep all of our kids alive, they're not getting diseases, they are getting enough water, they are getting enough food, they're not um, dying from just physical trauma, our population has grown and that's where we really see the boom in exponential growth in our population. Now what we've got to do is make sure that we go population stabilization. We don't want to go population crash. So we're going to have to force ourselves to go into that S-shaped curve and that's where decreasing the birth rate comes in. Last thing for this this lecture. A um, little bit more background. Uh, before we get in and talk about how we're going to lower birth rates and stuff, um, if you just went into a country and counted the number of individuals in that country, did a census, um, you could generate what's called a population histogram or an age structure diagram. On age structure diagrams, um, women are always shown on the right of the diagram, men are always shown on the left of the diagram. It's not because women are always right, it's just because on diagrams women are shown on the right, men are on the left. And what you would do is you would count the number of individuals in each age group. How many people are there from 0 to 4? How many from 5 to 9? And you go through those, adding an age group every time and counting how many they are. Uh, the population gets divided up into our three sections again, our dependency or pre-reproductive group, our reproductive group and our post-reproductive. Remember dependence 0 to um, 14, 15 to 44 reproductive, anybody 45 and older post-reproductive. So we get three basic shapes when we do these graphs. First graph would be um, pyramid shaped 
and that is an expanding population large numbers of children and an expanding population uh, notice that uh, this large numbers of children the dark purple box here when it moves up when we wait 15 years all those kids will be adults so we'll have more adults a larger number of adults who themselves will have sex and have kids so this population is expanding uh, the bullet shaped graph the type B1 is a stable population about the same numbers of kids as adults if you look the purple boxes are about the same size as the adult boxes so if you wait 15 years those kids will be adults now and there's about the same number of adults as there was before the purple box just moves up into the next section it's about the same size that population is going to stay about the same size and the last one often called a mushroom shape um, you can see that the purple boxes are smaller than the adult boxes the pre-reproductives are smaller there's less kids wait 15 years those kids become the adults now there's less adults the population is shrinking less adults having less kids having less adults having less kids a shrinking population so there are countries in the world that really do worry about their uh, population size let's have a look at a couple of them so our first group really uh, pyramid shaped uh, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, tons and tons of uh, kids. Those kids are soon going to become adults. The population of adults will be massive. Way more families being produced. Very fast growing population. Stable ones. You can see the number of kids is about the same size uh, as the number of adults. Places like Italy and Greece, the United Kingdom is very similar to that and then decline in populations very very few offspring um, and we've got problems here for Germany and Bulgaria where their population is just tiny it's not growing through normal growth a great example of this is actually Belgium uh, Belgium uh, has a very small child population compared to adults and that does cause problems um, it means that people paying in taxes is decreasing while the old people in the country are pulling out social security and using their uh, resources and it's very hard for the workforce therefore to maintain the standard of living when they're having to pay for so many older people so these types of, pop of countries generally have political issues that push to try and get their countries to expand um, Germany takes in uh, immigrants, large numbers of immigrants that causes problems within the population. Lots of uh, build up of distrust of immigrants in that country at the moment. People deciding that um, maybe we should vote to prevent this from happening. Uh, the reason that the politicians like it is because it tends to try and pay money in so that they can afford all these older people. Um, you hear the same thing here in the United States with the baby boomers. Now, we're lucky in the United States that uh, we still have an expanding population. Most of it is through immigration, but at least that expanding population is providing a workforce um, to try and bring in enough tax money f to support Social Security f for those older people. Now, if you've been listening to the news, you'll see that um, we definitely do not have a balanced budget there. Our old people are definitely increasing in number with our baby boomers, and Social Security is going to find it very difficult to um, pay for all of those old folks. But our issues are nowhere near as bad as those issues over in Germany and in the uh, countries that have that mushroom-shaped growth curve.